Welcome to the first Executive Fellows Industry Discussion Series. I'm Adrian Stevens, Senior Director of Development for the UCR School of Business. Before we formally begin, I'd like to inform attendees that they will be muted throughout the presentation and Q&A. We will be recording this webinar and we'll post it to our school YouTube channel. Please put your questions that, that you may have for the panelists into the Q&A as the chat feature will be disabled. I will be monitoring the Q&A for follow-up questions at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce Yung Zhang Wang, Dean of the UCR School of Business. Under Dean Wang's leadership, the School of Business has launched three new graduate programs, more than doubled its enrollment, and is now in the early stages of building a new state-of-the-art facility, reflecting the school's upward trajectory as a top institution for global business research and education. Please welcome Dean Yunzang Wang. Thank you, Adrian. Good evening and welcome to our first Executive Fellows Industry Panel Discussion. I'm very pleased that so many of our students, alumni, and friends are able to join us for this special event. The Executive Fellows Program is a unique program among top business schools. For nearly 30 years, the C-suite executives across all industries have volunteered their time and expertise to mentor and advise our students on their careers, new business ventures, and on professional challenges. We are honored to have with us an outstanding group of these fellows to discuss entrepreneurship, leadership, and career advancement strategies. Moderating this evening's discussion is Derry Anderson, Chairman and CEO of Salas O'Brien, a leading consulting engineering firm with over 1,300 members across 51 North American offices. The company delivers 5,000 projects a year without having a professional liability or any other claim in its history. Darren is a double UCR alumnus, earning his MBA in 1991 and has actively supported the school business through the Dean's Advisory Council, the Executive Fellows Program, and the UCR Board of Trustees. Please join me in welcoming Darren Anderson. Thank you, Yun Zeng. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. I'm sorry. I've had to switch uh, computers here. I'm having some network issues. And just as you might uh, uh, expect or understand, in this last seven days, my organization has been hit by ransomware from a cyber terrorist. And it has uh, wreaked havoc in our organization. And my 1,300 team members were down for, for five days here. Uh, and it is a massive issue that we're going to be dealing with as a nation in the Western world here. Uh, more on that later, but I am really excited to be here today and uh, share this time together with all of you and uh, with our distinguished uh, uh, fellows as well. So thank you, Dean Wang and Adrian and the whole UCR team for putting this together on what I hope to be a very exciting program. Um, I think uh, you will find these uh, leaders to be uh, outstanding, truly amazing people. Um, they have incredible perspectives to be able to share, uh, incredible leadership insight, and I think that you will find that they have stories that will help you in your early career and or mid-career, depending on where you're at in your uh, professional uh, lifespan. Um, I, I think what's important uh, today is really for uh, that they are going to be sharing their perspectives uh, they are all been very successful, I think, uh, very much in business and in life. Um, and I think they will all have a different uh, approach and mindset that you will be able to learn from. I know personally, uh, having gone through the UCR undergrad and graduate program, my most valuable uh, times were when we had fellows coming back to share their stories, their real stories, not what's just kind of in the press releases or that is uh, filtered but to really give candid feedback about their lives, the challenges they've had, how they have felt during their careers, and what were the values and traits and perspectives that they brought uh, to be successful in leadership roles. So I'm really uh, appreciative of these leaders here today. 
uh, to be vulnerable, to share their stories, to share their perspectives for the benefit of, uh, of all the participants on this line. Um, and I hope that there is no judgment to be made. Uh, it is really just to be sharing knowledge, to be sharing experiences, and to be candid with one another for the benefit of everybody on this call. I always learn a lot from other leaders' perspectives and how, how they think, how they approach the world, and uh, what they, yeah, how, how they work. Um, so with, uh, with no further ado, I'd say let's, uh, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, these four leaders. I'm going to be asking a lot of very tough questions, and uh, I think you'll be really appreciative of their insight and perspective. So what we'll do is uh, I'll ask a question and I'll kind of go around with each one uh, initially to really get their perspectives uh, on these first few questions. And uh, let's try to make it fast, fast paced and uh, quick moving. And so uh, Susan, I'm, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, clearly you've been very successful by uh, all measures. And uh, I'm curious of what attributes that you would share that have been the most distinguishing in terms of skills, traits uh, that have led to your success. Well, thank you, Darren, for, for the question. It's really um, a delight to be on this call and to support the Dean and, and the School of Business. As an alum of the great USARA School of Business, uh, I, uh, I benefited greatly from, from the school. Uh, you know, I, I have watched a lot of great leaders and I've also watched some very poor leaders. Um, I've experienced both in my career and also in the not-for-profit work that I do today as a leadership volunteer. Um, obviously, one of the things that I see is so important is integrity. Uh, you can just really sense when someone has integrity, that's something that's really important. If you're a salesperson like I was and you're, and you're working with clients and, and you need to build trust, uh, it, it also matters with the employee manager uh, situation as well. Um, if I'm asking someone to support a cause that I care about from a charitable standpoint. I'm only gonna to go to those that I think have a passion about the cause and that would like to know more about the cause and that uh, believe that I'm someone trustworthy that they can believe in. So I think integrity is really very, very key. One of the things I really also encourage younger students around is to really follow your passion as much as possible. Don't follow what you think is the greatest paying job, the fastest way to get there, but to follow what you care about, what matters to you, and you'll just be so much more successful if you follow along a path that excites you, that gets you um, interested in the work and uh, provides a passion for you to continue on. You'll be more successful that way in the long run. Yeah, right on, I uh, completely agree. I think trust in any relationship is a key to success, right, in life, and uh, you shared it. If you are passionate about it, you don't even think you're working and you can put your whole heart and dedication into it and it shows in everything you do, right? That's right. Uh, let's go to Beverly. Uh, thank you, Susan. Beverly, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? You're on, maybe on mute. Can't. Let's, let's shift to Tim real fast and then we'll come back to you, Beverly. Tim, go ahead. Um. So I agree with all the comments Susan made. Um, leadership is really top down. And everybody who's you know, been a leader on this call knows that. You, know, you have to walk it, you have to show it, you have to demonstrate it. Um, uh, as I have repeatedly told people, you may not have a legal obligation on that, but by God, you have a moral obligation. And, uh, and that's the way you treat your organization and you treat your people. Um, you know, uh, you know, in, in looking at, you know, you say, what has made you successful? The two things that I came up with, Darren, really was being innovative, constantly innovative and curious. And the other one is being relentless. Um, that, you know, I, you know, I used to say, no matter what, we will find an answer. I don't know what it is today, but we will find it. And, and if you can work as a collaborative team, answers come. David, let me ask you, uh, I, I love those two. I would say I'm not a terribly creative person. I don't even know if I'm terribly innovative, but I am relentless. Do you think you need to be innovative to be successful in business or to be a leader? I, no, no, it's a good question, uh, Darren. I think you have to be uh, willing to let others be innovative, 
right? You got to make sure you got the right people on the team. You know, uh, I won't use any current Dodger analogies, but uh, not everybody's going to be a pitcher, but you better have some good ones in the bullpen. Yeah, right on. Love it. Beverly, are you with us? Can we hear you? Still can't hear you. Let me, let me shift over to Mike real fast and we'll come back to you, Beverly. Mike, how about you? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I'll echo everything everyone said. I mean, uh, you know, to repeat, I think resilience for me, um, never giving up. Um, you know, there were times where, you know, you're faced with some decision making, right? And it's either push it or stop it. And, you know, so you got to make decisions. Being a visionary and having passion about what you do every day. Um, integrity, by all means, is the core essence of at least who I am and who I need to exemplify myself by. And then balance. And, and balance is super important in life, um, whether it's family or just even understanding your employees and who they are as humans um, and, you know, where, where you can push them, where you can't push them, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think uh, right on, Mike, to your point, uh, I think building relationships at a leadership level is most important, right? I mean, if you've got to be able to connect with people, you've got to be able to lead, motivate. And if you aren't one who is listening well and people don't want to follow you, you're not going to be successful, right? So they've got to believe in you. They've got to trust in you. And uh, they've got to want to follow your vision, right? And that you're listening to them and understanding who they are as people, right? It's a corny phrase line, but lead by example, right? And, you know, you do that, people will follow you. Um, that's my experience. So, yeah. We're good. Right on. Beverly, you with us? Uh... I am. There we go. All right. Oh, good. <laughs> Don't know what happened there, but good to see everyone. No problem. So you're two with us words. Now. Two words that come to my mind is perseverance and commitment. I think that, um, you know, in an age where everything is instant, everyone would like to have instant success immediately. And, you know, <laughs> being a business person, an entrepreneur, we know that nothing comes that easy, that you have to work towards it, you have to get up in the mo morning and uh, begin your day and go through the motions and you'll hit highs and lows and you got to wake up the next day and do it all over again. And so that would be something that I would, um, that, you know, we're celebrating our 30th year of business and that's something that has served us well. Right on. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, I know that's the characters of anybody on this call, but all the leaders that I know and successful people in life, it's, it is a total commitment. It is a uh, resilience. It is hard work, and uh, it is endurance as well, right? I mean, you have to have all of those characteristics because you're going to get body blows, and you're going to like you're going to get beaten to the ground sometimes, and you got to pick yourself up. And there's nobody but you. Sometimes, if you got great partners, that makes it makes it uh, helpful, right? So true. Right on. Yeah, love it, Beverly. So uh, I'm going to start with you uh, with this next question: How do each of you define success? both in business, professionally, we'll say, and personally? Well, you know, I, I was sharing that I had my business for 30 years. So during that time, we raised three kids and now have four grandchildren and then had the business through the whole time. And I think success for me, for my understanding is, um, not only living the abundant life, but being able to be the same person, whether it's with your family or in your business or in a, a whatever the setting may be, but just being true to yourself and then embracing, you know, moments accordingly. Very good. Being authentic, right? And who you are. People That's see right. through that so easily, right? If they think that you're putting on airs or not really the genuine and that's who you are and you care about them, you're, it's not going to happen, right? Right. right on. Uh, Tim. Um, sorry, the question, I'm sorry, again, Darren. Question, uh, how, how do you define success yeah. professionally and personally? Sorry, I, my mind was going somewhere else and making notes. Um, yeah. So, you know, in terms of business, um, um, I love to create businesses. It's, it's part of who I am. It's in my DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so... You know, in my mind, success in business is creating businesses or reviving businesses because I've done some turnarounds. Um, and and part of that is the joy of creating jobs for people. Um, not everybody can do what we do. 
and and we have to acknowledge that but being able to create something for them even when we're no longer part of it that's a big deal um and so in my mind that's it that to me is the definition of success in business sure. um personally is having people in your life that uh, uh matter greatly to you um and they know just as you stated you know that that they can rely upon you they trust in you they know your word is gold um and it's it's when you have that ability to, um, when you know they've got your back, man, you can accomplish anything. Right on. Susan, I'm gonna to go to you and then Mike. Well, you know, I think that it's, it's interesting because I was in software sales and, and ran uh, very large sales divisions for um, a long time, 25 years before I retired out of that. So that was a hundred quarters. Why was it 100 quarters? Because every quarter I was asked by my manager or my CEO, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> so that's right. how they measured success. Um, and obviously I measured it that way as well um, in, in a lot of ways. But when I look back on uh, my career, how I really measure it is, is not just that um, I was very strong at accomplishing my numbers, but I made some amazing, uh, through my colleagues, so many became dear friends and clients were clients for years and were people that I cared about. Uh, so that is really irreplaceable. Just, just the colleagues and, and how many of them became friends. And, and even if they didn't, because they moved away or whatever, um, we just always were pulling for each other. We were in a competitive place. We were really pulling for each other to, to do well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, that was really an awesome situation. Personally, uh, as you know, I'm involved uh, as a trustee with UCR and I'm involved with many animal welfare organizations. So for me at this point in my life, it's really about um, helping animals and it's about helping students. And uh, that's what I'm passionate about. So success to me is I, if I can really save that one animal, if I can save hundreds of them, if I can save um, millions even, um, or, you know, with regards to UCR and education, if I can support uh, students to be able to have scholarships they wouldn't otherwise be able to have, particularly knowing that UCR has, I believe it's 86% are people of color, our students, which is incredible, helping them become more socially mobile. That to me is what is personal success. Love it. Uh... And I, I want to thank Susan for being chair of the UCR Foundation Board of Trustees and giving so much of her time and treasure. And, and uh, we've got two others as well. We've got three of our panelists who are on the UCR Foundation Board of Trustees, and I'm sure the other one will be soon. So uh, look, mm -hmm. forward to, look forward to seeing that continued involvement. But thank you all for your support of our students and alumni and uh, to help UCR be even better and to make more of an impact uh, on our students and on, in research. So, uh, Mike, last uh, for you, how do you how do you define success professionally and personally? So, so I'm going to put my uh, CFO hat on and tell you success is about shareholder return, um, which is running a business responsibly, um, you know, focused on high level growth um, from a revenue perspective and then bottom line profitability. Um, just by means of example, um, I am a year, a little over a year into my job when I started. Uh, the company was losing over $20 million a year. Uh, we will be profitable next quarter. Yeah, great. That to me is a massive achievement. But, but doing that with honesty and integrity is key. Um, and then more importantly, being able to make meaningful contributions back to the community, whether it's hiring employees, whether it's doing philanthropic work, um, giving back has always got to be there. And then most importantly, I, you know, I always stress this, you know, balance lives for employees, making sure... You know, our, our biggest assets for us are employees. And, you know, we spend, you know, I spend 20% of my day talking about different things we can do for employees uh, to enrich their lives and make them better. For me personally, um, I want to be in a position in life to give back. Um, and, and that's what success will define for me. Awesome. I'll share for uh, members. Thank you, Mike, for that. I'll share uh, my vision as well of success professionally is, 
as, as a leader of Solis O'Brien, I want to make sure that I'm making an impact on all of my stakeholder, stakeholders in my organization. That includes my shareholders, it includes all of my employees, which are mostly shareholders, but also includes my partners uh, in, in our business, our clients, uh, and what we're doing in our communities. And uh, I want to make sure that everybody sees Solis O'Brien as being a highly reputable organization. We do what we say we're going to do. The relationships are so strong and so trusted that uh, it's just there's nothing. Everybody wants to be an advocate and a champion for Solace O'Brien. And if I can carry on that legacy and uh, make sure that our organization is perpetuating that and bringing the impact to my team members and their families every day and they have a safe, secure environment, to me, that's success uh, for me as the, the leader of our organization. And I'd say, personally, it's not too different from that. I uh, have many valued friends, a uh, <laughs> few of which are on this call, um, and that I always want to know that how much... I care for them, how much I appreciate who they are in my life, including my wife and my children and my my dear friends that, you know, on my last days, I hope I go, you know what, Darren, Darren made a difference and I always can rely on him and what a, what a good soul at the end of the day. And for me, that's success. If you're living your life that way every day, uh, so much comes back around to you. You're never expecting it. You're never asking for it. You're never hoping for it. But I can tell you, it always comes back around if you're always being generous and helpful and, and willing to uh, assist others. Um, let me go back around to everybody else. Your greatest greatest fear you faced in your life? We don't talk about our fears oftentimes, right? What were your greatest fears as a younger professional or even mid-professional or even today that you can share with the, the team so that they know that, yeah, as leaders, as successful business people, we have fears as well. So what fears did you face that you can, that are most notable or even today um, that you'd like to share? Let's go to Tim first. Okay, well, I was blessed, as you know, Darren, to have uh, two careers, which gave you very different views on things, um, private equity and venture capital. And, and uh, I will say my biggest fear in private equity was surviving an industry or global downturn of some kind. Um, you know, I always say, if I took my shirt off to see the scars on the back, you know, of, of having gone through all those, and the answer is, again, during that time period, you got to be innovative uh, and relentless to survive. And, and um, so those were the biggest ones, which is, is as it starts, as you know, you don't know how long it's going to last. So you, you just, it, I always say, plan for the long run. Thank God for the short run, if that's what happens. Um, mm -hmm. And, and again, I, in those time periods, I also look for opportunities right? We all know who the competitors are and you know who's weaker than you. And it's say, all right, this could be the opportunity. If you like them at 90 cents on the dollar, you're going to love them at 50 cents on the dollar. And that's just a way, because they may not survive this, right? I know, I know. Um, you know, in terms of today, um, I'm constantly lecture. I mean, I've, you know, this year alone, I've made 10, uh, I think, venture capital investments, all seed, which means you're working with young entrepreneurs. I love them. You know, I love their dreams. Hopefully you make them a reality. And, but they've got to have a long enough run rate. They got to have a long enough, you know, uh, uh, financial, you know, amount of money behind them to be able to withstand a downturn if one comes. And obviously we, we're still living through the end of the last one. Um, and, and so those are the toughest ones, which is, you know, making sure they understand that, that it's okay to take some dilution up front because you got to survive the storm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Susan, we'll go to you. Well, you know, kind of goes back to this. Um, what have you done for me lately? Quarterly, you're always, you're always living in fear of, am I going to make my number for the quarter? Am I going to make my number for the year? And you have to be careful not to let that overly define you because then, you know, you make, make some bad decisions along the way. So, you know, I always advise my team that while I held them accountable, I was with them through the process. I was their friend through the process. I would work with them, do anything that they needed. And sometimes it just didn't happen, but it didn't make you a bad salesperson. It didn't make you a bad uh, person. And 
Uh, I looked at it more from, yes, there's short-term goals that need to be met, but we have to also take a long-term view. And we can't just be defined by what happens in one quarter for our entire lives. And that was something that, you know, that anybody that told you they weren't fearing for their quarterly number at Oracle is probably not telling you the truth because of course you did. So uh, I think that that's important is to also keep a longer term view and not get too overwhelmed by the short term view and have a little confidence uh, that, that you're going to get through it if you're doing the right things. And if you've got, you know, a strong manager that's, that's supportive. Great, Beverly. Well, I remember early on, one of my biggest fears was uh, speaking in public. And here I am today, I'm doing it. So, you know, it, but it didn't come easy. It wasn't like something that um, I learned to do overnight or that I got over it. And I had a lot of different times when I've been asked to speak and I always get a knot in my stomach and um, feel apprehensive. But I think along just with time and um, experience and then just having those opportunities of being able to to share I got more comfortable with it I also took classes and you know I I did things so that I could get over that that fear keep persisting right yeah you knew it wasn't a natural gift for you but you kept working on it you knew it was important you wanted to be better at it and like I think all of us is that you're going to face this head on and while you may not be really good today, you want to get better. And it's that that passion and desire to say, I'm going to keep working on this. And you just keep trying and keep trying, right? So love that. Great message. Mike, how about you? Yeah, I think for, for me, it's the fear of change. Um, we're in a world today, it seems like every millisecond is changing. Um, and because I work for a technology company, there's always mm -hmm. a new technology that comes and you know, how soon can you get in front of it? And so while the world is changing, you know, if we move to electronic vehicles, autonomous vehicles, you know, the environment changing, um, you know, that all has an impact on, on, on business. And so that's probably my biggest fear is how do you plan more for tomorrow while you're in today? Mm -hmm. um, and then personally, much like Beverly, I was definitely afraid of public speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, and lots of practice, you know, lots of board presentations, um, you know, that's gone away. So I, I certainly have that empathy when, you know, I'm nurturing young folks in terms of their first speaking engagements. Um, but those are probably my biggest fears. Yeah. Love it. I'll just share uh, personally as well for the, the audience. Similarly, uh, I, public speaking was not something that I did well. I took a public speaking class in college and I absolutely sucked. I was the worst in the class. And I was like, I am never going to amount to anything. And similar to what the story here, you just kept working on it. You just kept practicing. You take the opportunities to learn and, and just develop. And uh, now I do okay with it. I'm, I'm less anxious. I'm less uh, uh, uncomfortable with it. And it's getting comfortable who you are in your own skin is largely uh, that, that confidence that, that you can bring and telling your stories. Um, I would also share is that um, I had a fear of failure. I've always had a fear of failure in my life. I don't like to fail and uh, I have failed uh, and a lot of valuable lessons that come with that. I also had a fear that I was not, um, that I was not good enough for a job. I got to, I was a CFO at 30 years old of a large organization, a 1300 person organization. And I was like, I was surprised that I got uh, the position they believed in me more than I actually believed that I could do the job. And I had this kind of imposter syndrome. I'm like, are they going to find out that I really don't know what I'm doing? <laughs> and I was like, I hope not. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. And you know what? They had more confidence than I did at that point in time. And they knew that I had the characteristics of learning, that I was going to evaluate it. I was going to make recommendations. I was going to take the initiative to make sure the organization was in the right place and have a thorough evaluation of everything before I made that recommendation. And they had confidence in my judgment, even though I may not have had the total skills at that point in time. So a lot of these things have happened. And I'll also share is that, uh, you know, one of the things on our personal uh, trade is that uh, I've, I've been divorced. Uh, I was divorced. My, uh, my uh, college uh, girlfriend and I got married. We got married for 10 years and uh, 
we ended up separating because I was working my tail off in my first 10 years of my career. And I sacrificed, uh, I would say that relationship where we, we moved apart and uh, didn't invest in the relationship. And uh, that was a, that was a big life lesson for me. Um, and fortunately now my, uh, my wife today, Lori, we've been married 21 years and, you know, I learned a lot of those lessons that you have to invest the time in any relationship if you want it to be successful, right? Uh, that's in, in, whether that's in your business partnership, in relationships that you just have friendships with, or obviously in a personal relationship with your spouse, is that uh, you have to invest the time and they have to know and care, believe and see the evidence that you are spending that time, that you care for them and you're looking out for their best interests always. If you do that, I think in life with any relationship, it's going to be successful. Um, and if it's not reciprocated, then that's where you need to make a decision that's not, not worth it for you. Um, I'm going to ask a question of uh, Susan and Beverly as women. Uh, maybe it'd be great for you to share the impact of maybe bias to in your organizations that you had been a part of or throughout your career uh, as a woman. Um, I would love to hear some stories maybe for our audience of how you've been uh, impacted as women and how you have overcome that and been so successful despite maybe uh, some of those obstacles. Let's go to Susan first. Well, it, it is tough and it was very tough um, in the competitive world of high technology to be a woman. I was one of five women that were hired at Oracle to be the first females in the managing uh, large counts. And uh, it was, it, it just was not really a company that was set up for, for women in, in any way, particularly in, in the sales area. Um, how did I deal with that? I just hung in there with the men. Um, you know, if they wanted to go to this place for dinner and well, then that's where I went. I, you know, I just did my job and I operated as, as if, um, there was no reason for me to, to not be in that, in that role. Obviously some of my managers were more supportive than others. I had been fortunate though, that when I was 23 years old, my first major job was with a woman that was 15 years older than me, was my manager in sales. She was an incredible mentor for me and she was tough as nails, but she was also had a big heart. And I really learned a lot from her. And I think a lot of the skills I learned from working for her for six years at such a young age really helped me deal with um, the high technology uh, issues that, that were being had by all women salespeople at that at that time. And it really taught me persistence, hanging in there, not willing to sacrifice my role so that someone else could come take it, but to fight for it, stick with it. And maybe if I had to work harder, well, that's the way it was, but I was gonna do whatever I needed to do to stay in the role. So it's nice that you had kind of an advocate, somebody who was a pioneer in front of you that could help kind of uh, uh, blaze the path for you if you're, or roll out the path for you, right? She definitely made a huge difference for me. Was that intentional for you to kind of align yourself uh, with that person or that just uh, coincidental for you? She, she interviewed me and I was so impressed with her. I just wanted to work for her. I just wanted okay. to be in the room with her. I think there's a lot to, to share there, right? Is that, again, not choosing necessarily organizations, choosing the path where you feel like you're going to have a great opportunity and uh, where that you're going to be championed and that somebody's going to share knowledge and help you be successful, right? That's but exactly right. Valuable uh, message that uh, Susan is sharing here is that look for the people that you're going to be working with and are they people that you are, that are going to influence you and are going to help uh, bring you along and and uh, share their knowledge and champion you, right? I mean, that's, that's key. Great. Beverly, how about you? I was sharing that we started our business 30 years ago, so I'm in construction. It's definitely a male-dominated industry, and uh, I learned early on that there's all kinds of people out there, nice and mean people, and I was told 25 years ago that um, from an a engineer on a job that we were uh, working on or starting to work on, that he told me that he believed that women belonged in kitchens, and so that was only 25 years ago. So today I'm building kitchens. So, you know, that was uh, kind of the story of that. Oh. But, um, you know, uh, I think for me, early on, um, like I just started getting immersed in the industry 
and construction is a very fascinating, fast paced um, business that you have to be flexible and you have to be risk adverse and there's so many components to it. And as an entrepreneur, I, I loved all that. But what I did was um, within the first three years of business, I became involved in industry but through an organization. And so by serving in that organization that was made up of men around the table, um, you know, I, I got the lingo down, but I also got to learn best practices and I took that with me as, um, you know, in, in raising the company and being out in the field and walking job sites and, you know, just um, uh, going toe to toe with, you know, uh, anyone that I encountered. And so I still do that today. Love it. Right on. Let me, let me ask both of you, uh, Beverly and Susan, is it better today for women than it was 10 years ago? And what do we need to do more of? Well, I would say certainly in the profession I came out of, high technology, that it has improved um, greatly. I know this because I have nieces that are involved. I have nephews that are involved. Um, and I, I see a lot more awareness. There's a lot more diversity, equity, inclusion awareness, um, uh, obviously very recently, but this has been going on for years. So there's and there's much more protections in place for people, uh, anyone that is harassed, uh, because harassment was was pretty big in my day, even if it was just verbal harassment. Sure. So it's definitely improved. We we definitely can improve, continue to improve on diversity, equity, inclusion. Because why is that important? Well, besides the moral reason why it's important. It's important because we need to be reflective of our customers, who they are, our donors, whatever our stakeholders are. We need to reflect who they are. And, um, you know, if, if the majority of them are people of color, it's, it's not very reflective if we're all white uh, males or all white females. So I think that there's still work to be done. I think a lot of corporations are taking this quite seriously and other organizations. And so I'm very encouraged by what I see. Good. We're going to talk about uh, ESG a little bit uh, further here. Beverly, your uh, perspective? Well, you know, whether it's a male or female or uh, someone that's looking to get into the trades, what I, I try to do is just encourage them to be their professional best, whatever it is that you're going to do, male or female or anybody in between. And I think that just, um, you know, I, I'm a female uh, minority myself, but I've never, I've tried not to have those kind of, um, uh, that kind of vision towards others and just respect a person for their uh, skill sets and capabilities and then encourage them to be the be best version of themselves. Right on. Great, let's shift to a different uh, question here. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna start with uh, Mike. Mike. With your knowledge and experience today, what what advice would you tell yourself, uh, your your collegiate self as a young rising professional? What counsel would you give to yourself when you're 20, 21, 22 years old? Would be yeah. any different? Um, and I'm I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sound a little bit like you. So I too married my college sweetheart, and uh, I spent really the first 10 or 15 years in the office till midnight every night. Um, I didn't understand the importance of, I thought the importance for me was building a career. Um, and unfortunately it was the expense of my children and the expense of, of my, my now ex-wife. Um, and so I think if I could have a conversation with myself, you know, it's one of those things when I change it over again, I don't know, because I have a, you know, I have, I'm remarried and very happy and, you know, I have, we have three children. Mm -hmm. Um, but it would be, you know, maybe being, you know, knowing everything isn't so important. Um, and, you know, that extra two hours in the office that you spent maybe, you know, eating dinner with, you know, workmates, you should probably should have been at home. Um, so balance, I think, is one thing I would definitely, uh, and it's something I live by today. And I, it took me 15 years to learn how to balance. I mean, part of that is to build teams and trust teams versus treat you trying to do all the work yourself. Um, but that's probably the, the best advice I'd give myself 21 years old. Great, Great counsel to Mike Symmetra, 21 year olds. Tim, yeah. Tim Greenleaf. 
There we go. Um, I'd say that, that what I would tell my young self is live is figure out who you are, what makes you tick, what is what gets you up in the day, what makes you operate. Um, you know, um, I do regret honestly some of the late nights in terms of particularly with my kids. Um, that said, you know, I was that kind of dad that never missed. You know the play. I never missed the birthday. I never missed any of those. You don't know what you don't want to know how many nights I didn't sleep. That's a different issue. Um, but but I mean it was they were that important to me. Um, but in my but if I was looking at a young person today and talking to myself, I'd say, look, live lean, right? In other words, as you get some success behind you, put it put it in the bank. You know, don't change your lifestyle. Live lean, be aggressive, be, be, be hungry, um, put good people around you. Don't admire the ones who are arrogant. And, and you know, I, I can, I'm sure all of us have on this call, on these calls have, but I mean, I've been blessed to know more than a few billionaires. And I can tell you that, and, you know, and I could rattle off the names, including world leaders, but, I, but you would never know who they were in real life unless you knew truly who that person was because there was nothing about them about putting on airs. Um, so I would say to my young self, you know, live lean, be aggressive, look for openings, understand who you are. I mean, I know I'm a thoroughbred, right? For any of you who have ever seen the, 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 in Kentucky, the foals come out at spring. You immediately know who the racehorses are. That's who they are. They run faster. If you try to stop them, they'll be frustrated. So I would say first understand who you are and then make sure your life, you know, kind of goes with that. Um, but in a changing environment, like Mike is talking about, look for the cracks, look for the openings that allow you to move industries. I, that's exactly what I did. And I was blessed by it. Very good. So now you're called, I'm going to be calling you Thoroughbred Tim. All right. Susan, why don't you go? Thanks, Tim. Okay. Uh, you know, just briefly, I think that um, you know, I entered UCR when I was 17, because that's when I graduated from high school. And I went through in three years with an economics major and a business administration double major. And I would tell myself to have slowed it down a little, give myself the extra time, the extra year. Um, it wouldn't have made any difference in my career. It would have helped me to mature a little bit easier or mature a little bit more. So life would have been easier because it's really hard to go into a fortune 500 company at 20 years old and, uh, and really understand everything that's going on. It, it, it's just, it's, you're barely out of high school at that point. So I would say I, I would have looked back and said, I would have taken more advantage of the school and all the offerings and taken that extra year uh, to, to really give myself the time to just even mature a little bit more so that things would be easier than entering the workforce. Very good, Beverly. Something I would have told my younger self was not to stop taking those aerobic classes. Actually, I think there's a lot to that. You know, when you're, you're young and you take it all for granted, um, things change as you get older. And I just encourage everyone to, you know, when you're at the epitome of your youth, to keep moving, to, you know, hike, bike, and everything in between, and don't stop that. Um, the other thing that I would encourage people to do is when you get those um, far and few moments of success, pause, pause for the minute and embrace it. Just enjoy it because that too passes by and until the next one. Be thankful. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, I would uh, share as well, um, I, I like uh, Beverly's I, uh, exercise and fitness is important. I bring, I, I, today I was out on the road riding my bike with my buddies at 5.30 in the morning, right? Got to get the time in it. It takes discipline. It's hard to, to get up every day, but I, I feel so vigorous every day when I do it and I've got so much more energy. Uh, I just tip for me. Some people have different ways that they get energy, but that's one for me. But I, I would share uh, from my perspective is that the sooner you know who you are, what you're all about, 
what's important to you in life, the things that are important to you, the values that are important to you, the people that are important to you. Uh, when you've got that crystallized, it makes your decision making so much easier. And I would say, be flexible and listen, but don't compromise in your values or your integrity and the things that are most important to you. And sometimes you may have to flex for a period of time, but don't don't ever uh, compromise what's the things that are important for you. And I'd also say what, what was surprising to me is that there are so many more people who have who are more intelligent. Uh, I would say at least intellectually for sure, um, but that. Uh, are afraid of, are, are fearful of taking the next steps. They're afraid of, of failing. They're afraid of uh, what other people are going to think. And they don't take the initiative. They don't take the opportunities when they present themselves. I see that happen all the time. And as much as I try to influence friends to say, take this on, you can do this. They're afraid of looking foolish or making a mistake or maybe even put in the extra effort sometimes as well. I don't know, but uh, I would say, think about what's important for you and uh, you probably can always do more than you think you can if people believe in you. Um, all right, so I'm gonna ask you guys, uh, tell me uh, particularly for those in your organizations, what do you think makes people or distinguishes people in your organization? What do you look for? What are the characteristics or traits that you look for in people to be successful in your company? I'm gonna start with Mike. Yeah, sure. Um, there's some similar themes I talked about before. I think the first one is just being resilient. Um, and that's the never giving up, you know, sort of chasing down the answer. Um, you know, that's a, a big value that we, we promote um, within the organization. Um, obviously, integrity. We talked about integrity. You know, you don't be afraid to be honest, right? Sometimes the truth is uncomfortable, but you know the truth will set you free. Um, certainly in business, and you don't want to be dishonest. That just leads to poor behavior and, and bad outcome. Um, you know, being a visionary—that's hard to do. Not everyone's born with, you know, the ability to kind of project into the future. Um, and then taking risks. I mean, it's okay to take risks, and we encourage it at, at our company. Um, we know people are going to make mistakes, but you're better off making a mistake, having tried versus not having tried at all. Right. On. Yeah. Uh, Susan. Yeah, I would say I work with a lot of not-for-profit CEOs of, of very, very large not-for-profits. And what I find is the good ones are never afraid to hire someone in as a direct report to them who is more knowledgeable on a subject than they are because they can't be as knowledgeable about everything in some areas. So, but the fact that they find quality people like a CFO as an example, uh, that is so knowledgeable and so skilled, they, that they've done everything right by finding the right person who then is a great support partner to them so that they are successful, therefore the organization is successful. I mean, I think it's that, uh... You, you hear the phrase that people don't want to hire. There are two components, right? You hear some people that don't want to hire anybody more capable than they are for mm -hmm. job security. But I can tell you from my experience, that is exactly the person that I don't want to have in my organization. I want to have, have the person in my organization who is championing people, who is hiring the best talent. To me, that's the leader because that's going to lift everybody up. And nobody should be afraid of their own skill sets if they're a, a confident person and the competent leader in an organization. You hire the best talent always, right? And that's yep. going to make everybody succeed. Yeah, right on. Beverly. When we're uh, hiring people, we tend to look for humble, hungry, and smart. Right on. Those are great characteristics uh, in trying to define, you know, those people that will fit with our, our core values and our culture. Our team uh, revolves around our core values, which is an acronym called QSTIC, quality, safety, teamwork, integrity, and commitment. And we have it all around our office and we talk about it often. And it's interesting because you can hire people with it and then you can also fire people if they violate a core value. And so that is something that has uh, served our company well. 
totally agree. Having any of those governing values of what's important to you as an organization, it allows you to say, to attract the right people and knowing that, hey, if you don't, if you don't think you fit in with these, stay aside, right? Uh, so how uh, people that are succeeding your organization, what are those distinguishing characteristics? What are they doing more than others maybe? And how, how, do, you, how do you measure it? Well, for the, our core values, so quality, what we do is um, we try to look at every job that we're taking on and go for industry awards. And so that sets the bar for the projects that we're bidding. Uh, for safety, we always try to, we have a great industry, um, uh, it's called EMR, which uh, is your mod for, you know, the construction industry, and we're always trying to better our safety programs and how we can make sure that everybody goes home in a safe way and look, and, and I guess care about each other in a manner that that's really what we want to do. Um, with teamwork, I would say that our company doesn't really go by title so much because, um, you know, we're, we're a middle-sized company uh, and there's still a lot of things that might fall onto a person's plate. Somebody needs to do it. And that's where teamwork kicks in. And I, I would say that our, our team is really good about just pitching in where needed. Integrity, so important. Um, if you don't have integrity in, in your, your culture, um, it's hard to, when somebody violates that, it, it's a way to uh, let them know that they don't belong and, and to let them go. And then commitment, that's something that has served us well for 30 years. And we have people that have been with our company 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and they've been committed to what we have here at Stronghold and, uh, um, you know, continue to do so. I think if uh, everybody on the call would listen to those values, that will that will drive your success in life and in business and every possible way. If you have total commitment to those values, you will do well. No question. Tim, anything else to add on that? You're on mute, buddy. The moderator, the other person was helping me too. So we were both muting it anyway. Um, you know, um, um, I agree with all the comments said. Um, um, I particularly like Susan's only because I've seen CEOs do this, which they were, you know, you should never be afraid to hire people smarter than you. By God, you better want to. Uh, and if a CEO won't, you got the wrong CEO. Uh, I will say in terms of people coming into the organization, I always look for team players, people who are willing to learn, people who are willing to mentor others and help them up because that perpetuates your organization. People who are willing to own the outcomes. Don't give me the excuse, own it. Um, you know, I appreciate you're willing to reach higher, but I also appreciate the fact you're willing to pick yourself up when you fail. And knowing that the organization is there for you to let you try again. Love it. Let me, let me ask the four of you, how important is hard work and hard work to being successful. How, how important of a characteristic is hard work? I, personally, Naren, I would say critically because it is through the hard work. I actually had a Jesuit priest say this to me, which I love, which is you always have to figure out in your extended hours, where do you have time for, for to be contemplative, right? So, in your hard work, you've got to have time to also be able to think beyond the horizon of where you're currently sitting at and plan the next move. But if you're only responding and you don't have that time to be able to do that, you'll never get there. So I think the hard work has to happen. Susan? Yeah, I mean, you have to put in the hours, especially, you know, early on. Uh, there's, there's no way around that. I think that's just part of, of, um, of a, just having a good work ethic and coming up to speed in certain areas. Um, but I, I do agree with what Tim said, and we hear this from a lot of really quality CEOs, that they do take time away to really think through things, both professionally and personally, in order to um, make a space for some of these new thoughts to come in and to ground themselves more and refresh themselves more. So I think there is a part of that that we need to make sure that we're that we're doing 
as professionals in our lives. Right on, Mike? Yeah, I'm gonna echo everyone. I mean, um, you know, I feel almost self-taught with all the hard work I went through. I mean, I wasn't a finance major, I was an econ major um, and went and got a master's degree and sort of embarked on this career in finance. And, and it was really kind of this chip on my shoulder that I had to be better and I had to work harder than anybody else. Um, and yeah, it, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, kind of like I mentioned, it probably cost me my marriage, um, but on the same token, it got me to where I am today. Um, I wish there was a little bit more balance, but you've got to be, you know, it's that, that affinity to, to understand the answer right? And, and that curiosity. And so I'm a builder. And as a builder, you know, you, you're always trying to find that magic answer, even though there may not be an answer. So yeah, hard work is definitely absolutely essential to success. Beverly? Thanks, Mike. Well, I learned a lot about hard work and work ethic in my um, teens. I worked in the fast food industry. I think everyone that's a teen should work uh, in the restaurant industry. I took that to another level. And when I was 20, I, was, I had an opportunity to buy my own little cafe, which I ran for three years. I don't think I've ever worked so hard in my life because it was owner operator and you know just trying to figure everything out out even how to flip an egg was a challenge <laughs> and so but you know i look back on those uh years and i'm just thankful for them because it did teach me a lot about hard work and work ethic and that i could do it and uh you know this last year with uh covid i i felt like uh, once again i was in the trenches just trying to figure out how to keep our doors open and keep everybody motivated and going in the right way that all that hard work um, served me well because i had to get back in it again and work hard excellent love it so i'm going to ask you guys all uh, another question here appreciate that uh that comment um what's the difference between somebody as a young professional, uh, mid, mid level leader to what's going to make the difference for them to be a senior executive leader or even CEO at some point in time? What's the difference? What are the differences in your mind that you can share with the team if they're aspiring to have those senior level uh, executive roles? Let's start with, uh, let's start with Tim. You're on mute, buddy. <laughs> I would say, Darren, um, not only people who can lead others and lead by example, but also do people want to follow them? And a large part of that is that do they trust them, right? Um, and, and if you have that going, then you can build some tremendous things behind you. Mm -hmm. um, they also need to have you know, the intellectual curiosity, and frankly, be willing to, even if they are the smartest person in the room, they better not act like it. Mm -hmm. Because that will kill your teams one way or another. Um, you know, we all remember the famous story coming out of uh, Apple, where, where, you know, Johnny Ivey actually covered up a, a prototype and refused to let Steve Jobs look at it. He, and Jobs was furious at him and said, why? He said, because you would hate it in its current infancy and, and, it would, and it would demoralize my team. It was the prototype of the first, first touch screen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right on. Good story. Uh, let's go to Susan. Oh, Susan had to jump off. I apologize. Uh, let's go, uh, Mike, how about you? Yeah, great. Um, I mean, the, the, the one lesson I will give, you know, in, early in your career, you're, you are 100% viewed on your output. Um, and as you approach more senior, you're 100% viewed by others. And, and, and it's something that is so intangible, you can't explain it, right? It's how, how other people view you as a leader, a manager, um, do they trust you? 
Um, and so everything you do in your career, whether it's early on, the hard work, the output, um, learning to be a manager, and then sort of that intangible skill. And I'll, I'll never forget, you know, sitting in a room and we were looking at candidates to promote to VP. And there was one guy on the bubble and the CEO says, you know what? I don't know what it is, but he doesn't have it. Right. And you know it when you see it, when they walk down the hall, I know my VPs, this guy does not have it. And, and that forever resonated with me. So it's how your, your perception, right. Is so important um, to make that next level up in your career. I'm going to challenge you a little bit on what those are, but I, I hear what you're saying completely. Beverly, how about you? I think attitude is everything. And so when people present themselves with a good attitude, that they they have that drive and that want and that desire, how can you pass them up? How can you not overlook that? Right on. I, I would uh, share from my perspective as well, when my mind shifted from thinking just about me or what I'm doing and that I was celebrating all the people around me and lifting them up and creating opportunities for them and recognizing their successes in the team's success, that was a big move to be a leader in an organization. And I think the more you do that, the more you're recognizing, applauding and developing people around you, they want to champion your success uh, and it's those trusted relationships as well that we talked about earlier. People have to trust you implicitly. They need to know that you've got their back and that you're going to be true to your word and that you are a good person. It's not to say there aren't exceptions to that, but you have to be a good person. You have to be diligent. You have to be thoughtful and you have to take the initiative. A lot of times people are, un are afraid to make decisions. And leadership is making decisions every day, hundreds of decisions that many people are very uncomfortable with. You, you're never gonna have perfect information, right? But you gotta get the information that you need to be able to move forward. Sometimes it happens sooner than you're comfortable with, but decision-making, taking the initiative, lifting other people, listening to them, making sure you're championing the team. I think those, those are the characteristics which differentiate people who are working for others versus those who are leading others. Your thoughts on uh, that, Tim, Mike, Beverly? I had heard early on that uh, delegate, um, figure out what you do best and delegate the rest. And so when you're building a team, there's something about um, not having to do everything yourself that you have to understand the qualities and of your team members and you have to take that next step to trust. And so I think that is a, a big movement between um, someone who is uh, might be in a management or a worker level to becoming a leader. Right on. Tim, Mike? Yeah, I was going to say, I think you also got to be open um, that not all race, you know, some resources are great in the quarter mile. Other ones are better in the full mile. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure you we've all seen it where you've had people coming up to the ranks, you're going, wow, no question, that one's leading the pack. That doesn't mean the other ones won't come through. Um, you know, and right. so I have to tell you, I've cautioned more than a few management teams about, you know, um, you know, I used to call it convicting somebody too early. Um uh, you know, on, on how they felt about it. I was like, you know what, slow down, give this guy a chance. He may not be as fast as the rest, but give him a chance. Uh, because, you know, I, I think there's something under the hood uh, of that one. So really is, it is truly believing in your people. I will tell you one thing that, that um, uh, and, and Beverly, you just hit on it. One of the things I also look for is that you see some great people who are really good at getting it done themselves. But when they start to get elevated in management, they can't stop micromanaging. I, I, I know I had to learn that just because you can, just because you're the best one in the room to do it, doesn't mean you should. Um, you know, um, and, and there are other people, let them do their job. 
mentor them, develop them, right? Because that's the only way you can leverage yourself over a greater greater group and make a bigger impact, right? And part of mentoring though is, hey, you got to let it go. It may not come back 100% the way you want it, but you didn't have to do it. Yeah. Mike, how about you, bud? Yeah, I mean, you know, everything you said is just hits the nail on the head. Um, and again, when I say perception, it's sort of the embodiment of, of all of what you said. And, but, I, I, you know, your, how you're perceived, how I'm perceived by investors, how I'm perceived by people who work directly for, for me, how I'm perceived by my CEO, right? Like that is the dynamic that, you know, sort of you're faced with every day. And, you know, ultimately you got to know how to make decisions. I mean, I probably make a thousand decisions every day. Like literally when I'm done with work, I tell my wife, you know, she's like, what do you want for dinner? It's like, just cheat for me. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's like the last thing in the world I want. Like I want to just, like, my wife calls my outfit a uniform. Like, I just don't want to think about, you know, it's like I wear the same, they're different pants, they're clean, but you know, I just want less things for me to think about because literally the second it hits 7.30 and I'm on a call, what should we do? Make yep. a decision. And it's like, you know, I think it's almost like my, my, the best analogy a boss told me, he said, life's a little bit like the SAT exam where you're going to have five answers and you're going to go in your mind and you're going to robotically think of them. You're going to cross eliminate three of them that don't make sense. And you're going to get down to two. And the, and the more experience you have, like it's easier to define between the, the final two to choose the right answer. Um, and yeah, just decision-making. I've seen so many people, just the inability to make a decision and it's crippling. It is, it yeah. is. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a huge distinguisher as a leader, right? Yeah. Uh, so we got, we got five, six minutes left. Uh, kind of do a little bit of rapid fire. I got three questions. I hope we get to them. Uh, I will go around kind of quickly to you guys. ESG, environment, uh, social, and governance is a big movement kind of today. I think it's always been a great practice. I'm curious how important it is, is it for you, Mike, and your team, and why? Yeah, I mean, it's super important. I was just on, we have a board meeting on Monday, and so I oversee um, HR. And we were going through the statistics. Um, and, you know, 30% of our workforce, we have 500 employees, 30% is of some other origin than, you know, white. Um, we're, we are about 47% female, um, which is actually pretty good. Um, but where we fall off is in the senior ranks. Um, we have a bulk that start out females, mid-level, and all of a sudden when you get to the executive level, it just disappears. And so you know, it's super important for us. I mean, I believe that having balance in terms of diversity leads to sort of that integrity, that honesty, and also that, you know, that perspective of human nature, where someone came from, they didn't necessarily come from the same place of you. And it's not sort of this old boy school, you know, camaraderie um, in terms of getting things done. Um, so it's super important for us. Um, you know, we're hyper-focused on it. I mean, obviously, as a public company, there's all this new disclosures that mm -hmm. are coming out around ESG. And, um, and on the social side, I mean, you know, I, I want our company to give back as much as we contribute. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be, re I mean, it was hard with COVID. We couldn't do things in person, um, but we're going to work kicking around ideas at least this quarter where, you know, we've got the big brothers and the big sisters, which I think is a super worthy cause um, of doing things with those, with, with those outfits, you know, for canned food drives during the holidays, you know, any way where, you know, sort of that social importance of giving back to the community. Um, it's, it's so meaningful and uh, we need to make sure it's part of our DNA and our culture. Yeah, right on. Carla, I'm going to go to you. Well, with that note of social, I am very proud of our team. We have a charity committee that is um, team member ran, and uh, they make a decision to give out of their paychecks. And through that, um, it's just been really neat to, to see what our employees give their money to. So one year it was for veterans. And so not only did they give to veteran causes, they did uh, construction 
um, work for veterans, or it could be elderly was another year, kids was another year. And uh, what we're finding too is um, we've had some of our own team members have things happen in their lives. And, you know, it, it's just so wonderful to watch everyone just either pass the hat or come up with um, different kinds of uh, fundraisers to raise money for, for those kind of things. And then we have a lot of fun too. We have the American Heart uh, Kickball Tournament coming up, which uh, the first year our company won. <laughs> Last year, uh, they didn't have it because of COVID. Um, the second year, we barely were there, but, you know, it, it's just that kind of fun raising, getting together and raising money for causes. Um, it's great. Awesome. awesome. Let me, uh, Tim, maybe uh, just a brief uh, response there and okay. I'll go to the last uh, question. As you know, I mean, I'm a huge proponent of giving back to the community. And I think we have, again, we don't have a legal obligation, but we definitely have a moral obligation to do that. One thing, though, that, that I would slight distinction is that one thing I have found really helps connect with the employees to the community is where you give company time to let them physically go work on these projects. Um, I, I, one that came to mind was we did these backpacks of uh, filled for needy kids of back to school things. Obviously this was pre COVID. It's one thing to fill the backpack but, and I, and, and God bless my HR person who did this, it wasn't my idea, but she got a bus and said, put everybody on it, take it down to the school. And the employees got to see the look on those kids' eyes when they handed them the backpack. And, and I mean, we had grown men and women coming back with tears in their eyes. That made it meaningful. Awesome. I'd love to talk a lot more about ESG. Uh, Salsa Brian is huge in the ESG area from sustainability, energy efficiency, and governance and social impact and DEI, but uh, we have no time. I'm going to ask kind of a final question to the three of you. Uh, I'd love to hear in, in less than 30 seconds, what drives you today and what do you want your legacy to be? Let's go to Beverly first. What drives me today is uh, my relationship with the Lord and uh, serving him and my legacy, if I could be known for just being a good person and living an abundant life. Love it. Mike. Yeah, my, my family what, is what drives me and my legacy will be my kids being terrific human beings as they're older. Love it. Tim. I would say I want my legacy to be that I was a good person that I was ethical and fair in my judgment, but also that I created a lot of businesses that created a lot of jobs to help a lot of other good people be good parents to create their own legacies. Right on. I think uh, with that, uh, I want to just first share, I know we've got some Q and A session, but uh, I really appreciate the, the candor uh, from you guys. Uh, I learned a lot uh, still about each one of you and. I really appreciate your openness and sharing and taking the time here today with uh, with the group. Uh, so thank you. Adrian, I'm going to turn it over to you to maybe uh, if there are Q and A's from uh, some Q and A from the, from the audience. Thanks so much, Darren. I appreciate it. Thank you all for that enlightening discussion. The insight provided can, can be so impactful to our professional and personal lives. And, and I, I really appreciate uh, the value. Um, there are some questions that came through, some really interesting questions actually that were submitted by the audience. So I think we'll just jump right in here. So Beverly, <laughs> the first one. <laughs> All right. As an entrepreneur, how do you stay focused and motivated even when you're not seeing the desired results? Well, those results could be either personally or it could be from your team. And uh, I think, you know, last year we did something very cool. We uh, moved from our corporate office into even a better corporate office. And it was a, a change of pace. We got to design this building like we wanted and it just put a skip in my step. 
And, you know, it was all about, we have people that have been here for a long time, but also building our bench and, and just actually uh, having our daughter join the company um, has been a wonderful recent movement that's occurred. We get to interact daily and she's, she just is like a sponge just soaking it up. So I think, you know, you have to find those, um, be thankful, you know, for, for the good things that you're provided, but just also, um, you know, love what you do and which I do. Can I, can I just even uh, add on to that? I love what uh, Beverly said and I, and I would only share that when you're doing great work and you're making a difference in your communities and people's lives, you're going to have tough times. There's no question. You're going to have tough situations, tough issues, but when you are rock solid in your purpose, personally and in this business it makes the tough times easier because you know you're going to get through it right. and when you've got great teams and partners around you and darren if i don't if i could add to that for just a moment when you have those tough times clearly communicate with your teams when when you're on the winning team you immediately assume everybody else behind you knows you're the winning team that's not true they have a lot of worries about what's going on you need to communicate where you're going and what you're doing. Communication is key, key frequency and appropriateness. Yep. Sorry, Adrian, I uh, interjected there. Let's ask some more. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Well, I appreciate that. Okay, so this, uh, the second question goes to Tim. Now, I know you talked about, about being innovative and relentless. So perhaps these traits are important in your, in your answer on this one. So which crucial characteristics should a leader possess to make the impossible possible? Oh, um, be willing to be wrong and learn from it. Good advice. Good advice. I, I appreciate that because that's a scary thing in, in being a leader. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, one of the top Google guys, he's, I loved his comment. He said, if, if I was going to teach anything in schools today, it'd be fail fast. And how do you recover? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, let's go to Darren. So what new dynamics are you currently experiencing and projecting in your industry for 2022 and beyond? Wow, what a, what a softball, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we are a, a firm that is in the center of the fairway for all things kind of uh, ESG as we talked about before. So. Uh, we do critical infrastructure, we're building the nation's hospitals, universities, utilities, data centers, telecom, pharmaceutical facilities. So we are, what I would say, we're, we are advancing humankind through the built environment. And uh, we are one of the top five uh, companies in, in the U.S. and North America that are doing that. And in those market sectors for mechanical and electrical systems, we're top two, top three. So uh, we make a huge difference uh, in, our, in, in the lives of people from the time they're born to the time they're rehabilitating a hospital, the time they're going to school and uh, college, uh, when we're using our infrastructure network. So everything for us is all about creating a, a better world around us, a uh, more responsible world, a more intelligent world, keeping us safe, keeping us rehabilitating. And the amount of money that's being spent in electrification and uh, improving our uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure is, you know, what we're all about. So there aren't enough people uh, to do that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a good place for us to be. I'm really, really excited about what the next uh, decade looks like for Saul's O'Brien. We're in a good place. And it's just finding, finding great talent and developing leaders and retaining people in the organization. Great. I appreciate that. All right. So Mike, we're going to, we're going to switch over to you. And this is a softball as well. What macroeconomic trend most excites you? <clears throat> wow. What macroeconomic <laughs> trend? <clears throat> um, I mean, you know, I'll be a little selfish here. I, th I think the move towards more sustainable energy 
Um, you know, we're, we're a company, you know, our mission is very similar to, um, to others, you know, we're, we want to take technology like artificial intelligence and make the world a little more safer, more vibrant, more prosperous place to live in. Um, one of our initiatives is around green energy, where you know, we're helping a utility back in the East Coast um, upgrade their entire facility onto solar and battery power. Um, and with our technology, make real-time decisions, um, whether you know there's cloud cover, you know it's windy, maybe there's a little more wind today, so wind turbines are blowing harder, um, and more efficiently, you know, push energy across the grid, um, and then ultimately, you know, saving tons of efficiency in terms of spinning reserves. We lose about twenty billion dollars a year in spinning reserves. It's just energy that either gets lost in the ground or just goes through the ether. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm most excited about, you know, the, the world waking up, um, the climate changes and us creating an environment, you know, that our children's children are going to be able to enjoy um, the world. Um, so, and selfishly, my company's right at the forefront of it. So hopefully we'll be able to, to enjoy the ride as well. Right. Right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. So Beverly, I'm gonna circle back around. Adrian. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your best advice for achieving an executive position in an organization? How, how does one go about securing that highest level position? Start a business then you're already automatically right. at that level. <laughs> <laughs> you're already there. You're there. <laughs> All right, does anyone anyone else wanna, wanna try that one? You know, it's funny, I've got a quote <clears throat> and it's from Michelangelo who who's the world renowned painter artist. And the quote literally is, if anyone understood the amount of time and effort I put into my mastery, they wouldn't think it would be so wonderful. So it's all about hard work, dedication, learning from failure, right? And you know they say, if you don't study history, right, you're gonna repeat yourself, um, but that's the same in business. So that would be my one last you know, hurrah for everybody. All right. All yeah, right. I mean, at the end of the day, Adrian, I would, uh, I think we just shared earlier, but um, being a leader, uh, requires uh, fundamentally it's easy to be a leader until you're tested and character isn't revealed until you're in challenging situations and circumstances and that really shows who you're all about when there's not a script anymore what is your character who are you how do you respond how do you think about people how are you thinking and your ability to make decisions when the outcomes may not be so certain. Uh, and that, that is what tests character, it's what tests leadership, and uh, how you handle those situations and how, as Tim mentioned, how you communicate with your team and make sure everybody is engaged with it uh, is, to me, what, what leadership is all about. Uh, how, do you, how do you motivate? How do you inspire? How do you uh, build an organization that, is, that uh, goes beyond what any one person or any few people can do, right? From my perspective, being a leader, I want to build an organization that sustains long, long after I'm here and that it's not dependent on any one person in the organization that we can get better. The more people are contributing, more people are driving, but it's not dependent on any one person. Uh, to me, that's what leadership does is leaving your organization and your team in a better place than where you began. Well, I sincerely appreciate that. Unfortunately, we, although we have more questions, that's all the time we have uh, currently. So, you know, I, I'd like to take a minute to invite alumni with us this evening to follow the example of our panel and volunteer your time to make an impact at the School of Business. Please consider becoming a mentor, serving on a career panel, hiring a Highlander, 
or just by referring a friend or colleague to UCR and one of our outstanding graduate business programs. Use the QR code on the screen, you'll see it there on the right, to learn more about these opportunities. With that, a big thank you to Darren Anderson, Susan Atherton, Beverly Bailey, Tim Greenleaf, and Mike Zometra for all, all that you do for the UCR School of Business and for spending time with all of us this evening, sharing your experience and wisdom. Thanks so much. And thank you all for attending this webinar and have a good night. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Bye. James. Have a great right. night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.